welcome to Art Collab with Sarah and Nat. Nat and Sarah. <laughs> so our episode today is Art is Serious, Craft is Fun. But we thought we are gonna change it up um, real quick and um, uh, tell you first what's new with us. Because we thought, you know, sometimes we don't say that. And before we dive into our topic, um, let me ask Sarah, what's going on? You did a thing. I did a thing, yes. I actually printed on my wall. Like I had the supplies to do this thing for months. And I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And then finally I printed on my wall and it just looks fabulous. When you open, I even sometimes come through the front door just so I can see it. Cause I, we have a side door this way, but you know, I'll come through the front door and I'm like, oh my gosh, it looks so good. But I can't wait to add some artwork to fill up the wall. So that's the next step in this. Yeah, journey. I posted the link to the YouTube video um where you can see how she did it and you should mention actually um sarah that this is your brand new super osballs <laughs> sorry <laughs> awesome awesome <laughs> elephant stem yes so um if you do go to our foamies there they have available the small small the, the original one that i had made and um, this one's going to be exclusive on my website. So I'm just waiting for my box to arrive. So I can post it on my website, but this will be coming soon on my website. So yeah, check it out. And also check out Sarah's uh, YouTube channel. You can subscribe, see all kinds of amazing videos. And I uh, believe every Friday you're posting a new video, right? Yes. But, it, but this Friday will be what we're doing today. <laughs> Uh, right. And then you also said you're doing something. You you gave me a link. Um, yeah, so the, um, I'm participating. I'm a, one of the panelists of the Art and Soul Emergence with Tracy Gatlin. And um, that actually starts today. But my day is June 5th. Um, it's a free webinar. So feel free to join. Um, and then each day there'll be a featured set of artists. But for me, this is one day because... We went a little over, so I did like an hour and a half worth of content. So that's why I have my own day. Um, I actually um, have not much to share uh, besides that I changed my studio up. Um, so here's a little uh, picture of that. Um, I have a new desk and I put it in the middle of the room and um, I changed everything up a little bit. So um the view that you have of me right now is different as well, uh, as you can see maybe if you've joined us before. So I will post about that all soon, did a little reorganization. I'm super happy with my, with my new layout and oh boy, uh, is reorganizing a uh, studio a lot of work and crazy and it never stops right and yeah. then i also uh, worked on some patterns and new designs for art foamies which i hopefully can share uh soon so there's nothing to show uh really maybe you see something in the background there's a little peek of it but um i won't <laughs> say much and um today's episode we made a statement, right? We said art is serious, craft is fun. And we want to talk a little bit about what um, we think or what is, and we want to discuss this with you guys as well. Again, you can put questions in the Q&A and also chat with your uh, friends on the chat, um, talk about it. So what is art and what is craft? Craft, is there even a difference? And um, we want to discuss this a little bit and then we will dive into some other parts that are part of this discussion. So, Sarah. <laughs> I just, I mean, the reason why we, were, we want to discuss this is because I just feel frustrated by having to define what I'm making, you know, whether it's art or craft or craft is art. Like, why does it have to be named? It's something that I made. And if I declare it as art, then it is art. If I say it's craft, it's craft. It shouldn't be like a negative connotation to 
whatever I'm making. You know what I mean? And I also feel like too, as being a woman, you know, it's considered, sometimes it's considered like craft is for women and then like art is for the the guys. Like, you know, you've got the Picassos and the whatever, that's considered art because they made it, you know, or Jean, Jean-Michel Batiste, you know, all those folks made these things, but there are women who have done the same thing, but that's considered sometimes craft. And then the other thing too, that I recognize there's a show that comes on PBS called Craft in America, mm-hmm. which I love. They only release like three episodes a year or something like that. And to see someone from, like an indig- indigenous person create this basket, this like mm-hmm. amazing basket. Yes, it has a purpose, but it's also beautiful and well-made. And to me, that is art but some people it's craft. (laughs) So I don't know (laughs) how to quantify this or how we can move past this. But I think that we shouldn't put like too much pressure on people to define what they're doing and just accept, you know, what they're doing, you know, at face value. Yeah. I think there's a, it's an interesting thing because, um, I would say the weird narrative sometimes is like art art if, if it's two thousand dollars it's art if it's two hundred dollars it's design and if it's <laughs> 20 bucks then it's craft right mm-hmm. like um i feel i feel like sometimes there is this weird connotation of uh art um has to be expensive and craft is like cheap and I saw something that Anne Lou just posted. Um, I always thought um, that art is craft, but craft is technique. As an artist, I try to use the, um, the best craft at my disposal. And um, for me, like, there is no art without craft. Mm-hmm. Like, you need, you need to be the master of your craft or, you know, in the moment that I do not have to think about how to use like in the moment I forget how to do my craft I can make art there is no art without craft that's my that's my uh theory um don't know people might think different about that Leslie just asked but what about crochet toilet paper covers she's like pushing it right into our flesh and wants to know what we say about that what do you think about that question? Or not the, the question, like, what do you think, um, what would be an answer from your perspective? I think it's always, to me, I think it's up to the artist and what they, what they assign it to. Because, you know, when I was in art school and we learned about Marcel Duchamp, the, the ready-mades, like this, he literally took a toilet and hung it on the wall and sold them, <laughs> right? I, I mean, like, it's not something that he made, but he picked it up and he just put it on the wall. Like, that to me is like, he defined what what he was putting on the wall, right? And I think, I don't remember which um, show it was, but it was that one artist who taped a banana onto the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> With duct tape, okay? But that was considered art. People came and, and took photos in front of it and all that good stuff. And it's just like, wow. Um, and then for me as being a, a book artist, I remember that semester where we had to define what an artist book was. And every time that I'm like out you know, talking to people and I say I'm a book artist and people, oh, you, you're a scrapbooker? N- no. <laughs> so I was like, I had to like envision like a painter, right? A painter will paint the pages and make a book out of it. That is an artist book. And people still don't understand. So literally I take photos of my work and put it on a website. So when People ask, I just go to the website and show. This mm. is what an artist book is. Um, because that's me, I'm defining it. This is what it is. 
Um, I feel like if I'm an artist, I take the things that I made, like I'm a printer, a printmaker. I take my prints, bind it into a book. To me, that's artist. That's an artist book, right? Because that's me defining it. But I don't want people coming to me and telling me what my work is. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm defining it because I made it, right? And um, I just feel sometimes it's just a little frustrating to me, especially being a woman and mm-hmm. a person of color, you know, always it's like, oh, you're, oh, you do little stamps. Oh, <laughs> right. And it's like, you're minimizing my work. I'm literally taking a piece of something, carving it out and making something from it. It's not little stamps that I bought from Joanne's. It's, it's like art, you know, my yeah. craft. and it don't minimize, you know, the work that I do. I think that it's, a, it's such a loaded discussion for people. And I don't think actually it needs to be that loaded. Like, I feel like there's so many emotions about it. Um, I agree that if you say it's art, then it's art. And I actually, um, I have a friend um, Adam, who is a pretty prolific artist and he has his art um, in museums all over the world. And, you know, like they have it in his, in their collection. And he never went to art school. He basically dropped out when he was uh, 16 out of school and he knew he just wanted to be an artist. And at, at one point we were talking about it and he said, it's pretty clear. If you say it's art, it's art done. Like, no, there's no other thing. But I think there's also this way of how like um, men sometimes are uh, way better in just saying, you know, it's art or the same as sometimes. um, And I I don't want to be too gender specific, but they are growing up with more, um, at least in our generation, maybe still like this. Uh, they can just say it's art and this is how much it costs, right? Versus oftentimes we are like, oh, uh, I don't know, if is it art? Can I really call it art? Uh, and I don't know how what, what I should ask for. Can I ask for something? Can I ask for more money if it's defined as craft? Uh, or, you know, people then say like negatively, oh, it's craft. You shouldn't charge that much. Like, yeah. really? like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, like, what do you see in it? Do you see anything in it? If you don't, then, um, then maybe, maybe it's not art in your view, but that doesn't mean that it, it's not art, like for other people. I don't know. Yeah, it just reminds me um, when I used to make invitations for weddings, I had one bride. Um, so I made it was a lavender set of invitations. Um, I literally hand stamped um, and then did like blind emboss on all, all, of, all the invitations and did like a vellum overlay. And, and I remember her saying to me, anybody can just do this. Why are you charging so <laughs> much for this? Why can't I just get cards from Michael's and, and make my, my own invitations? And I'm like, well, you, d- you can most certainly do that. But what you're getting is me. Like you're getting personal, like one of a kind invitations that no one else will have. And you can look back on them and say, this is like a one of a kind thing, a piece of art that was given to all my friends. And this is a representation of what your your wedding is going to be like and what the color scheme is going to be. So it's really in, you know, the moment of, creating this thing and um you know I, I, I was like yeah go to Michael's and pay a little you know $25 and and print it on your printer it's not gonna give you the same to me the same effect um the love and care that I'm gonna give to creating this thing and so yeah anyone can make invitations but you know everyone has their own way of doing it um and I feel also like I was thinking about this craft thing I think craft makes you better. Like you're working mm. on it to make it better and better. And, and, you know, if you go back and look at the old books and the old invitations I made years ago and you see what I do now, like there is a progression and the level of things that I deliver today. 
because of all that time that I spent on my craft. So again, it doesn't, it should not be minimized. You shouldn't try to, you know, shortchange, um, you know, my work, you know, like if you go to Chipotle <laughs> and you're going through the line, you tell them what you want to eat. And then you say, like, well, I want guacamole. That's two fifty two two dollar fifty um upcharge, and you say sure, add it. <laughs> That's what you're paying for. It's an upcharge to um, have this work from this person. You know, it reminds me of a um, you mentioned um, Marcel Duchamp, and it reminds me of something that I uh, once learned. And um, sorry that I forgot the name of the art uh, that he uh, the art piece. But it is the um, it's, it's a bicycle week on a uh, bicycle wheel on yeah. our little um, um, hawker. Uh, what's that in English? Oh no, a it's book? a little uh, like a little a seating thing, like a oh little, yeah 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 uh, window thing. Yeah yeah. So I forgot what the name is, but the funny story that I heard, I was at MoMA and I took a class at MoMA. And um, you had a, like a gallery walk was part of the um, classes and the, um, a stool. Thank you, Birgit. <laughs> so it's a bicycle wheel on a stool. And um, the guy who was teaching the classes that Julie and I attended, uh, he was a conservator for, uh, for MoMA. And he told us this crazy story that A, um, the piece of art, of that artwork that came to MoMA wasn't the original of what Duchamp did. In fact, he had done it. And then, you know, he was traveling, he was going away and everything that was in his studio uh, got like, you know, in the time was just like uh, sold off or thrown away or, you know, and they were doing a retrospective of his work. And um, someone was looking at photos of his old studio in Paris and said, what about that piece? And he said, well, I don't have it anymore. And then they were like, well, can you recreate it? And he was like, yeah, actually, I could probably recreate it. And but I want to have the same thing. I want to have the same. Uh, I got this uh, bicycle wheel from a flea market or whatever, you know, and the stool from somewhere else. So I need to do the same thing, but I need to source it kind of like the same way. So he put it together, um, you know, the way how he had done his original artwork. And then this got sold to or somehow ended up at, at the MoMA collection and was valued at an insane amount of money. Right. So it wasn't actually even the original piece anymore, but it was still done by him. So fast forward many, many years. There is an there. It's in the gallery in the uh, collection. And I forgot which time it might have been like in the 70s or 80s. What happened? You know, you had less security in the museum. And what happened was that someone actually grabbed the wheel and ran out with it. Like he managed to get out of the museum or maybe it was the 60s, whatever. He got out. We can look it up. And he got out with the wheel. And then he felt like this is not good what I'm doing. I'm going to get in trouble. He was an art student, apparently, which turned out later. He threw it over the sculpture garden and the wheel scattered like it was totally broken. Right. True story. And so... What do you think MoMA did? Because that piece, the like the artwork from Duchamp is still at MoMA. It's in the permanent collection. If you walk through MoMA, you will see it. Uh, what do you think MoMA did? He asked us. Did, um, did they like have a conservator sitting there piecing every single piece together? Hours and hours, money and money. Or did they get a new wheel and just like made because it wasn't it wasn't really like they what, what did they do what you think they went and got another wheel that was like it nope what did they do put it together they put it back together hours and hours uh, I forgot he said he put a price tag actually on it it was insanity 
and and made it they restored it yes so it's an inter it's interesting when you think about like art what's art like putting it back together you know then is the the craft of putting it back together is that still the original artwork which wasn't the original artwork i mean like these are all just names for something right yeah I thought it was such an interesting story. Like you look at something, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you could have sourced the same wheel from somewhere else, right? You did I'm it before. Sure. Yeah. What? Why wouldn't you follow his method to find the wheel and add it? So is it still the? Is it still art? Is it still his art? Is it art? Well, I mean, if they recreated it, I mean, if they um, took the exact thing that he, whatever, picked out and then put it together. So yeah, it's still his art because they just put it back together. Same thing happens with paintings. If it's, you know, worn out or whatever, they go back and you have painstakingly trying to <laughs> fix it. At, you know what I'm saying? And still hanging on the wall, like, you know, it's fully restored. Yeah. Original glory. So it's, it's, so, it's so interesting. Leslie has another question. She wants to, not, to um, push another button. Okay, Leslie. Leslie is like on her, I'm kidding. What about following someone else's pattern to create the thing? Interesting. What do you think? I think that's a great way to understand how, to, how these things are made, right? So... If you go back to, let's say the basket idea, right? And you wanted to learn from the indigenous person. And, and a lot of times, like they're the only ones who know how to do this, this technique. So you go there and we're gonna do this. <laughs> you go there, you learn how to do this thing. And then eventually you start having your own way of doing it because you figured it out, right? Same thing with like um, book binding. Um, I have skip steps. Like I've even actually taught a class at my old school. Um, and my I could hear my professor gasping because I was skipping steps because I had figured it out. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to do all this extra stuff. <laughs> I'm going to skip it all. And she's like, and she's like, no, but next time, you know, Sarah's a, um, a professional, she's, she's gotten her degree so she can do whatever. And I'm like, no, you don't have to do all that. Just skip it. <laughs> just, just skip it and, and you still can achieve, you know, the same result because you figured it out. And it's just like a pattern. Like it's, a, it's like you're stepping into that person's shoes who did it before and you can experience how to make it. And then you can go off and run off and do it your own way. So I, I really applaud doing something like that. Um, but isn't when you're just like for me, for example, if someone is, and that that's cool, like you should copy in order to learn. I think what you're doing then is you're learning the craft. Yes. You're learning the craft to later then make the art. Yes. So you need to be honest to yourself in the moment that you're just copying someone else. And, and you're not bringing yourself in there. You're like, you're working on your craft, mm -hmm. your craftsmanship. You're, you're, I mean, you might call yourself an artist, but you're not doing art in that moment. You have to be completely honest. Yes. You know, just like, like I call myself a flag book artist. You know, I tell everybody this was originally created by Haley Kyle. And I've read her books and I have followed her. And I learned her techniques, but this is how I do it. I say it in every class that I mm -hmm. teach. Anytime I'm, you know, doing a, um, a, a, and I'm speaking in front of the public and I'm showing my work, I always say, this is the person who originally did it. I learned from her, but this is how I do it. Always. It's like, it's like, you know, when you write a paper and you have a bibliography at the end, this is where I got my resources from. This is where I learned it, um, because honestly, you can't say I just just came up with my, my in my brain. I just figured it out, and there's some instances you have figured things out, but but you can't just take credit. It's like when people on Instagram who like take your work and just post it on their page and don't 
don't tag you. That's exactly the same. I mean, sometimes you just don't know where things come. And I think sometimes, sometimes it's a little bit tricky because you're like, okay, I don't really know who was the first person who did that. And someone else, you know, teaches it. And then it's like, you weren't the inventor of this technique, but there are some very distinct things that like, if, if you say like, she's a, she's a book binding uh, artist and she has all these like different methods that no one else did, but her, but by then, like she figured those out Mm -hmm. and you actually happen to know that this is her, then of course you give that person uh, credit. Right. Um, So like, I don't know. I don't like I've done uh, embossing powder to create texture on canvases. Uh, Am I the first one? No, like probably not. I experimented. Mm -hmm. Is someone 10 years later doing the same thing? Yeah. It's just in the nature of it to try things out. Do they have to give me credit No, Because it's just out there. Like some things, I think it's a little difficult to really put down where that came from or but if you know I learned that from someone or some sometimes I see things that you know will never forget the first time I saw it and no one else knew about it like uh Birgit Copson for example she did the magazine uh like a really cool magazine printing technique I will never forget the first time she posted it years ago and people went like OMG and now everyone has done like some sort of video on that um, but I will never forget that she was the original source. Like I happen to know that, right? So then I will then I will give her credit, of course. So yeah, but it's the, like you're tr- training the craft to make your own art. I hope. Um, well, I mean, this is how we think about it. People, other f- people might be thinking differently about you know, is it if you copy. Can you call it art? Again, it's an honesty, right? Yeah. Well, if you think about like, say, um, Japan, you know, I always go back to Japan and you think about someone who like say makes wasabi and their father made it and then their great grandfather made it. And then, you know, all the way back. So it's like a long line of people. So if you go, you know, generations back, right? That first person started making wasabi, but now the person's making it now has has the same tools, but may have figured out how to do it, but they still have that thing that was passed down through generations. And the same thing with art you know, or craft, either one mm-hmm. of those things, it's like, we're passing this down. Like I'm passing it down to my daughter or Heidi Kyle technically passed it down to me. <laughs> I mean, not not directly, but I learned from her. And then now I'm going to pass down my knowledge to someone else. So it it's an honor. I, I see it as an honor to be able to take something that someone else has learned or figured out. I learned it and then pass it down to someone else and make sure they know this came from Haiti. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's an important part of you know, being um, an artist, when you share that, Mm -hmm. you you give recognition to the person where you learned it. I mean, and then there's always also something about behind it. And we wanted to talk to talk about that uh, nervously a little bit, because we're going to touch on some pretty tough things that we're going to discuss. But, um, you know, what, like, sometimes you have, you're teaching, Right. And then you're teaching the craft of making art or what we perceive personally as art. And um, is there, um, you know, is there and then so you have a followership, you have people that are want to learn from you. And sometimes and that's why we're we were actually coming to this discussion. Sometimes you have people when you post um, your art and it's, um, you know, maybe um, touching on something that's very dear or deep uh, touched you in your life or 
um, that is important for you as a topic, um, as a human being, um, people got, get upset that you're posting that. And they said, you should, you, you're, you're a crafter. You should just put out things that make me feel good. <laughs> and you're like, uh, is that so? Yeah. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about art that is from other people that has touched us and tell a story about it. And then also show some um, art that we made that people perceived as um, an affront. Um, I don't know why I'm saying that so Frenchy right now. <laughs> As a punch in the face, they received it, unfortunately, and got mad. So um, I want to I want to share a little story uh, first, just because it's on our slideshow, and then Sarah goes. Okay. Um, so uh, many years ago, I think it was 2013 or 2012, my friend um, Julie Pfeiffer van Balzer visited me in Germany. It was the second time she came, and. Um, we went to the, uh, in Hamburg, Germany, and we went to the Jewish Museum in Berlin. And we um, saw an exhibition. Uh, we, do, we saw, all, it was a very, very interesting and very uh, great um, thing to do because, um, so I'm German and um, Julie is um, half Jewish. And so this was uh, a very, um, you know, it was a very important thing for us as friends to go there. And while we were um, we were walking through the museum, we heard I, we heard this unbelievable sound all of a sudden, and it was very um, it was almost like you're nearing a cafe in a like very huge or restaurant in a very huge room and things were clinking and it was very loud and we were like huh where is this coming from this is ridiculously loud like you're almost like feeling like you know why are they doing this like they should have soundproofed that better so that people can uh, concentrate of the on the artwork and as we're nearing uh, a room we are seeing this um, as you can see here there are um, all these little, very roughly made faces, right? There were uh, little plates uh, with these faces and um, the artwork was called Fallen Leaves. And um, actually um, it was in this long room and you were supposed to uh, walk, you were invited to walk over this and that would make the sound. Um, here's Julie doing it. So I set my foot uh, the first step on it, and it was, um, it, I couldn't. I will play you a little video on how it sounded. I, I, I physically got ill just thinking about walking um, on these faces, um, you know, uh, of course, also with the background of our history in Germany, right? So um, feeling like these are the fallen leaves, the fallen, the died, um, people that died or were killed. Let's not, um, you know, make it nice. Uh, they were killed by us Germans. Uh, and so I physically couldn't do it. And here's, here's how it sounded like. So this video is not by me, this video, I found it on Vimeo. I just wanted to, uh, I back then didn't do a video. I just wanted to uh, share it with you guys. So you have an idea of um, what it sounded like. And, um, and, and I was, you know, it, there were so many thoughts in me in that moment when I saw that. I thought it was like, I don't know, just the, um, ferocity of how it uh, physically uh, like made me feel was just um, unbelievable, 
right? And I've never forgotten this piece of artwork, like never. Um, and when people say like art should make feel you good or art, like this, the, it made me aware, uh, not aware, like uh, it's a hard thing to talk about, but like, you know, when you think about um, the history as a German and what we did um, in our history, um, in that moment, like you're, there are so many thoughts that you have and it's like, uh, a screaming of, you know, you hear these, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it makes me very emotional to talk about it too, but I thought it was such an important piece. Like, I would not want to miss this piece. And even though it's so hard for me to talk about it, even 10 years later, uh, just because we're, we're carrying this history in us, I think it's uh, like... I think it's important. I want everyone to see this. I want everyone to experience this um, and learn about this and learn about this experience because it's also nothing in what actually people that were there experienced, right? So um, yeah, that was probably one of the most touching and emotional artworks that I've ever um, experienced and seen in my life so far. Um, pretty hard topic, I know, <laughs> but I wanted to show, I wanted to share this. Um, and we talk about that, how that influences us. Um, Crooks, tough, huh? <laughs> I mean, like seeing the video is probably harder than actually just hearing about the story, probably, but uh, yeah. It's similar to the experience when I visit the Holocaust Museum in DC. So there are two levels or two main areas of the museum. There's a museum that takes you through like different artwork, right? And then goes off to the, the right-hand side. But then if you go to the left-hand side, there's this like timed experience. So you stand in a, um, in which when you come down here, you have to come visit with me, but you stand in an elevator and you write it, they're telling you the story of, you know, what's about to happen. Um, they give you a little book um, of a person that went through the Holocaust, but you're reading it throughout the experience, um, but you don't know if they actually make it mm. um, until the end. Because it, it tells you like this this time you read this page this time you read this page blah blah blah. So, right when you come out, you see like the bodies, the burnt bodies. Like when you walk straight out, then there's a section of just shoes, just shoes, and you can smell like this. It was it was a smell, a visceral mm -hmm. smell. Um, in that area. And so not only you're getting the visual experience, but you're getting the sense experience. And then the thing that really hit me the most was towards the end. And they had this like section or area where it showed a list of people that helped during the Holocaust. And it was so small, mm -hmm. like people who actually went and rescued people and it was like a small little little thing of a list. And it just like hit me like no one really tried to help. Mm -hmm. I mean, people did, but I'm saying not that many people yeah. tried to help. And, and when you go through that experience, it's just like completely life-changing. You know what I mean? So I totally get it. Yeah, and I think that what this also does is for people that might not know about the history, um, um, I mean, that much, or maybe, you know, the longer times are, the longer times is passing, people want to forget about these things, right? Or they don't want to teach about this anymore, and um, which is wrong. But what I think what's important is that uh, this this has, of course, might not have the same impact on someone else who doesn't really know much about the history, right? If I mean, I I, I can't wrap my head head around if you wouldn't, but um, it 
did does something with you and then you might go home and you might like not forget the artwork and you might like do some research and learn more about it so i think this is so important right like art is such an important uh way to also uh transcend feelings and emotions but also the urge to know more to dig deeper and uh, learn more about what was displayed and shown. Um, so I think that's very important, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a very dark way of, of, uh, of doing, like of showing it, of course. Um, and we want to show you something that was very important to artwork that um, touched Sarah very deeply. And that might, on the first glance, uh, do not evoke these feelings right away. But you need to look closer, right? Should Should I go to your um, slides, Sarah? Yes, go ahead. Let me see if I can make this bigger. This is unfortunately as big as I can do. That's fine. That's fine. So honestly, it's um, Rachel just talked about the Civil Rights Museum where there is a Rosa Parks, Parks um, exhibit, there's a bus um, that you actually get on and you experience the, the whole thing. And then there's also where the, they did the sit-ins. So they actually have sometimes, it, not every time, but sometimes they have people come out and then recreate the experience of sitting in the cafe and being yelled at and things thrown on you and all you know, that stuff. So it's a, Def, that that one's actually in Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had to go through that twice. You know, that was a part of my diversity and inclusion training uh, when I worked at Best Buy years ago. But yeah, I had the opportunity to do that. But so fast forward to this. This work um, is by Amos Paul Kennedy Jr. He is a lot of press printer and um, Again, it goes along with Rosa Parks. It's really about Rosa Parks saying, no, I don't, I don't want to get up. Um, I don't want to move from here. And the reason why this moved me is because my first three or four semesters at school was really hard for me because a lot of things that we were learning was more European focused, right? Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't see myself in this art, you know what I mean? We're making it, I'm learning how to do it, blah, 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 but I couldn't see myself or I didn't see anyone else doing it that looked like me. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so I did my research and I found him and I found, so actually the, the next one that you're on the slideshow mm -hmm. is, um, it's not, not this one, it's the other one. It's like red, red color. Okay. I was trying to get home from work. That's it. This was the one, the first one that I saw. All I was doing was trying to get home from work. And when I saw this, it really ignited me. Like I could use this as a platform to express how I'm feeling, right? Mm -hmm. I never had thought about that. Like I could use my art to express or even like put a mirror up to show people you know, what they're doing, right? Or to get them to think differently. That's a part of my artist statement, to get people to think differently about what's happening, right? So um, so I started following him. I even like emailed him. He's a hard person to reach, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> he actually came, this is before the pandemic, he actually came to Pyramid Atlantic um, to teach a four-day class. And... Um, so I was like, of course, like a groupie. I'm like, yeah, I gotta be there. I'm gonna take his hat. Like, I will take care of him. What does he need water? Like, I'm gonna be there. <laughs> and um, he was so super cool. And I learned a lot from him. And, um, and so like his work like sticks with me to this day. And here's my child coming in saying hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> It's BB. Okay, cool. Go. Good to see you, BB. <laughs> but um, so we can fast forward to the next slide. So um, 
So this is a work that I did for my thesis project. So my the written thesis, which is like 50 pages, 50 to 100 pages, I did a lot of writing. My thesis was like, how does the the visual representation of Jim Crow affect how we view Black people in the media today. So that was 2016. And basically what I did was I created this game. So there are four Black people, um, you know, two adults, two children. And basically you pick a card and it'll say something to the fact like um, Viola Davis just won an Emmy for how to get away with murder. You take one step forward. Mm. And then if someone said something negatively about black people, and you know, I'm not gonna give you an example. I'm not gonna say exactly what it is because it's not really nice, but say something negative, right? Like um, people are the, you know, N word. You would set that person 10 steps back. Mm. And then, oh, this, the first like African-American um, mayor of whatever town, you take one step forward. Someone says something negatively, you take 10 steps back. So it's just like how we feel as black people every day. It's like, we're going, we're trying to take a step forward and we keep getting set back. You know what I mean? So I wanted people to feel what that felt like mm -hmm. by doing this game. And so there was four seats and people will pick a card and they go through. And so when we had opening night, I literally had people doing the game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they can feel. But I think the next step I'm going to do is actually have the stanchions bigger, like the big mm -hmm. the actual pieces bigger. So you can kind of put weights on it. So you have to pick that person up and then bring them forward and bring them back. So that's my next iteration of that. All right, so <laughs> Black Lives Matter. So I created this stamp for um, Art Phonies. Um, and I remember when it was being debuted. So like they were, um, the person KP, she was going through and showing all the other artists that she was you know, debuting that day. And then she's like, yeah, I just, you know, we're gonna do a special release for Sarah Matthews. And this is her Black Lives Matter stance. And so before that happened, you could see people chiming in, oh, that's beautiful, that's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And then when they featured my stamps, it was complete silence. <laughs> I can attest to it, I saw it. <laughs> silence, no one said anything. And I was like, wow. But they're still on the site to this day and I don't mind it. And I keep using them. I use them in a lot of different prints that I make um, because it's me. You know, I when I see the folks that have been killed or brutalized, I see my father, my brothers, my cousins, me, my sisters. I see us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've got, I've got to use my platform to, to show you what's happening. You know what I mean? It's affecting my life. You know, I've been pulled over by the police recently for driving my own car <laughs> and them looking at my ID and just ferociously typing everything and trying to see if I had warrant, warrants and I didn't, you know what I mean? And I'm sitting here freaking out in the car, like, this is gonna be my last day on earth. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of reality that I'm living. And so, yeah, I'm gonna to continue to make stamps like that. And I remember when you told me about the story when you got um, pulled over with your uh, car. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, wow, I've, I mean, besides that I don't have a driver's license, <laughs> But I never had to think about that ever. Like, what is going to happen to me if I get pulled over for, you know, something just not working on my car? So um, 
uh, putting that in artwork and making other people aware of it. Um, but here's another uh, really big print. I want to actually first show you're making it before we show the piece. Okay. Um, here is uh, Sarah, so you have an idea how big it is. It's huge. Yeah, it's a wood block. It's two feet by three feet. And um, this has a special significance. So this was like during the time where they were trying to build, wanting to build this wall between us and Mexico. And I started thinking to myself, how many other walls have we built in the past that we don't talk about today? And I was reading this article about the number of black people who don't know how to, to swim. And I'm one of those people who don't, don't know how to swim. And wh why is that? Because there was a certain time where they didn't allow black people to swim in a swimming pool. And um, so I found this sign um, where it was talking about the public swimming pool, white only. And I decided to carve this out. And I'm telling you, like, it was, you know, the very act of carving every piece out was therapeutic for me, hmm. you know what I mean? Um, but I knew it was gonna be a tough like thing to see it on the wall for people to see, you know what I mean? Because this is like, this is history. Like we, we have done this before, now we're trying to do it again, right? Hmm. And it's not, it's not working, right? This is not working for our, our society. If you think about it, from the tip of Canada all the way down to Argentina is America. <laughs> Let's be real here, right? It is America. So why are we saying, oh, I'm American and they're, they're illegal? You know what I mean? No, they're all Americans too. And if it, it, they're disenfranchised and they're, they're suffering, they're seeking asylum. They need help. Let's help them, you know, instead of sending them back, you know? You know, that's my whole thing, right? So um, I remember having this in a show. So I knew it was gonna be tough, but I put it in a show. And when I came to opening day, this piece was like all the way inside, like behind something <laughs> hidden from plain sight. And I was like, oh, that's how it's gonna be. <laughs> I was like, why would you just put it all, why didn't you bring it out to the open? Because this is, re this is real life. This is what happened. Just like yesterday was the anniversary of T the Tulsa massacre. It happened. Let's stop like throwing it under, you know, under the bus and hiding it. Like this needs to be said. And honestly too, it's a visual, vis visual representation of sometimes how it feels to be a person of color or a woman, you know, this is the good old boy section. <laughs> you know, we're having a meeting without you. You know, we don't want to hear what you have to say. You know, the doors are closed to you. This is the fence we're putting up because we don't want to hear anything that you have to say. Um, and so it wasn't like a physical barrier, but it's a, it's a mental barrier that's put up in front of us every day. So, yeah. Yeah, I think there is something... Um, this is very powerful, and um, but I also want to say there's something that I feel that I lost since I moved to the States <clears throat> in 2013. Um, I did this, this is an old painting that I did like many, many years ago. Um, and it is actually, uh, you know, I was in Hamburg in Germany, and this says, uh, no human being is illegal. And it shows the harbor. As you can see, this is old work. I'm not showing that because I'm particularly thinking that's still amazing or anything. This is, is like 20 now. years ago, right? But it is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. But um, when, when I posted these things back then um, on my blog or, you know, I uh, never had a feeling that this would be a big problem. I had like comments and people were telling me things, but ever since I moved to the United States, I feel like 
there is a huge censorship going on um, where, and again, my experience is of course different than yours, right? I cannot, I'm not, I don't have the same experience as you, um, as, as a black person, right? Like uh, that's even, that's like, I'm like, a, I'm like the privileged person and feel like, like censored, <laughs> right? Like, I just say like, I've, I'm way more careful. I was, I started being way more careful and anxious because people were hammering things out all of a sudden and when, and saying like, you can't post this or, you know, you, you do artwork that just says um, vote and people would write me and say, why are you alienating people? Um, like you are alienating 50% of your, of your uh, followers. I got emails and I was like, I don't even say who to vote for. I mean, it's kind of obvious that I'm, you know, a certain mindset that I have probably from the work that I do. Um, but um, why, why do you feel the need? Why does it make you so angry? And back to what we what, what we talked about, the artwork that touched us, right? The artwork that, um, invoked like very, very, very deep feelings in us. You with um, Amos um, Kennedy and um, for me with, for example, with the Holocaust piece, when I think about that, it's not the same of course, but I'm saying um, actually good. If this invokes such deep feelings in you that you need to write me that I should shut up or if it invokes such deep feelings in the people that they try to hide your piece of artwork uh, in the gallery, in the exhibition, then actually work is done, man. Yep, I did, I did my job. You did your <laughs> job, right? Like, like trying to see that in a positive thing, like when people start to stifle you and to say like, you cannot show this, you should not do this then actually you did the very same thing that other artists did with us. They provoked, you provoked a reaction. They understood the message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the funny thing is they came to me at the, gal at the actual event saying, that piece was so, you know, it just hit you right in the head. And I'm like, <laughs> It's all the way hidden behind a wall. Okay. If you see it, it hits you in the hat. <laughs> right? Oh, you You're allowed to, to see it. it. You have to hide it because of that. <laughs> okay, fine. You know. <laughs> it's interesting because you like, I feel that you're, um, you do have pieces that are more, um, subtle like I don't know if I if I'm allowed to talk about that you you did this book that you showed me recently which we do not have in this in the slideshow um the with one the, with the with the holes oh I'm whispering now as if no one else is hearing it yeah so basically um it's so hard because it was um I don't know how to explain it, but you know, when you're making it, you could feel yourself like there's a change in your body. Like I can, I could feel the change in my body and my eyes and my mind when I was doing it. So yes, I make flag books, but I was like, so what can I do to show the visual representation of being shot? Mm. But you know me, I'm a pattern maker. I use all this color. But this book that I made is completely white. It's just white with holes. And um, it will be in the Anne Marie Sculpture Garden um, coming up in the summer um, in their show. Um, I think it's called Lights. It's actually called Lights. Mm -hmm. And um, so I will illuminate it. And basically it's just a representation of <laughs> guns in America. Yeah. We are, we are terrible. We need to get rid of them. We need to go. Um, too many people are dying. You know, it's an epidemic along with a pandemic. It's all, 
you know, we were losing too many people to stupid things. So let's just get rid of them. That's, that's my point of view. <laughs> no, it's true. I, yeah. But it was also interesting because Sarah actually sent me, we, we text each other uh, fairly often. And you actually, you didn't even say anything. I didn't know you were making it. I didn't know any background. You sent me just a picture of the book. And I was like, oh, that's beautiful. You know, because um, we also had like watched their, um, we watched their pottery show and there was something that I had just seen where they made like lanterns and they had poked out little piece like holes. And so I thought like, maybe that's what Sarah is referring to. And I'm like, this is so beautiful, you know, what it got, like how the light comes through. And it is beautiful, unfortunately. And then Sarah says, well, this is what it represents. And I, I, I had, a, a, again, I was like this sick, like sick feeling, right? Like in this case, if you do not know what the thought of the artist is behind the piece, then you, um, you see it differently because when you look at art, you're, um, it's all about the context, of course, too, right? The context of where you see it, when you see it, and what do you know about the artist? Like, does it does it tell the story uh, in a in a very uh, obvious way, or is it more subtle, right? Mm -hmm. um, how important do you think it, it is for a piece like that? Like, what was I know you told me that, but what was your thought about? You actually wanted this reaction, right? This yeah, is so what I want people, like when you come into the gallery and you see it from a distance, you're like, oh, that's really nice. Until you read the description next to it. Then you're like, oh. And that's what I want. Mission accomplished. You did that with me. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. I yeah. want you to feel it. You know, and you, you know what? The, you know where I got the idea from? Um, when I watched this video, um, it was in Washington Post, and it was talking about um, Brianna Taylor, mm -hmm. and they were shooting the holes. They were just shooting, just shooting. You know, not only from within from the door, but from the outside. You know, through the screen, the screen door, right? And and the bullet holes went all the way through to the neighbors upstairs and then the side, they just didn't have any regard for anybody's life. You know what I mean? And so that's where I got the idea of poking the holes in the paper. I think what's so amazing about it too is that you made it as a book art because <clears throat> it reminded me of like a book is like, like your life is a book, right? And there are chapters in this book, there are pages in this in these books that are not filled mm -hmm. like they will never be filled with the story of these people so making like for me it's so symbolic that this is a book and there are unwritten chapters because these people were taken uh killed um you know died uh through the hand of guns so i thought that was that is so it's, and then also, it's a story, the same story over and over again. Right. Haven't learned from it. What's the definition? That's the definition of insanity. We keep doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome, and we keep having the same outcome. Someone dying. So that's, that's what it means. Right. So the question then is... And it's weird because we're trying to cram this into an hour, which could be like- You already went over. <laughs> yeah, you're already over, which could be like, you know, like a series almost. But the question is like, when we post something um, like that, or if we share this, then, and like, we are not, this is who we are, right? Like, this is who- we are and that defines our life and our thinking and every, everything we do. So you can't take that away and say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't post that if you're teaching art or if you're, if you're you know, 
you should only do like the feel good things if you're like if we can't you can't separate the one from the other because our craft is there to make our art it belongs together for us but it also this is us like this is who we are and what drives us right this is who this is how we this is how we are made this is you know, the things that we're doing, the things that we're learning, this is how we are becoming the artists that we want to be, right? And um, the thing is, it's like people can try, like you, like we were talking about last week, I mean, last month, you know, please tell me I can't do it. <laughs> and you know, please tell me that I shouldn't be doing this. Please tell me, because then I'm going I'm to really do it, you know. I'm watch really, me. <laughs> watch me, you know what I mean? Like, don't. I'm not going to give up, you know? So when I, cause you know, there I've watched my, you know, when you go to YouTube and you see your analytics, which I don't recommend that you read all the time. Just, just don't, just don't do that. But I do pay attention to likes and unlikes and it doesn't matter if you like or unlike one of my videos, it's still, it's still engagement. So it really doesn't hurt me per se, but I feel like, um, people tend to unlike things that push the boundaries. Mm -hmm. But we're not Nutella. <laughs> you know, like not everyone has to like us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I totally get it. And then I was like, I know I'm doing right when you get some unlikes or you get like, oh, that's ugly. I actually got a couple of those. That's ugly. Or um, you're a piece of, you know what? Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I know <laughs> the right track. <laughs> Don't watch me next. I'm going to do something even more because people need to know. They need to understand, you know, yeah. Um, your aunt says, continue to tell the story of the ones who have paid the price because they can't speak your or their voice through your art. That's beautiful. Thank you, auntie. That's so true. Um, so... That was um, that was a tough one, I'm sure. Um, and I hope, uh, thank you for guys for uh, sticking with us and, um, you know, let us um, talk about this. Um, I know that was, yeah, like a, <laughs> we would love to hear a little bit about what you're thinking. Maybe this has to sit a little bit more. Maybe you have some questions and we can always um, make maybe a second part to that so that we can yeah. uh, answer more questions that you might have or, you know, things that you want to tell us about it. But um, to finish this up, sorry, again, it's like so abrupt, <laughs> but um, our next episode will come up on Tuesday, July 6th at noon again. And we will talk about the art of self-care and um, yeah, I hope you will come back and don't hate us. Or maybe <laughs> we can't do anything. About it. <laughs> maybe we have to rest after that conversation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank we'll you. We'll come back to it. We promise. We promise. We will come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will not always do it like this was a heavy one. Uh, yeah. We know, but it wasn't. It was very important. Uh, we we wanted this discussion. We want. We wanted yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Um, have a wonderful week and um, see you soon. Bye. Bye.